Uh, so we're at the Uptown Farmer's Market. This is actually our largest market and uh, probably one of the largest uh, farmer's markets in the, in the valley right now. Although all of the markets are contracted right now for the summer and also for the, the pandemic that we're all still uh, going through. So this is probably the smallest that the Uptown Market ever gets. Typically, it's this entire parking lot that we're that we're in and then there's parking surrounding it for people so it's a it's actually a huge event for us uh, and so these are our wonderful uh, uptown farmers market uh, crew members uh, they actually joined us early spring this year and of course have both already ended up uh, working in the bakery uh, it doesn't take very long for people to sort of find their way to the bakery uh, especially if they're willing to package for us. Yeah, some people just think they're too good to put bread in bags and they try to get the production rolls. But everybody who puts bread in bags and wants to, they're the ones who get rewarded with the ability to run our mixer or stand in front of our 450 degree oven. <laughs> These guys have both done that. And actually today we are enjoying uh, Dylan's Creation as one of our new specials. So we're, uh, we're running some really cool specials right now on bread and, and later today at market, I'll be talking more about them. But Dylan sort of worked his way from market hands to packaging to uh, working, working as an oven assistant for a few weeks. And then he worked as a mixing assistant for a few more weeks. And then I challenged him to come up with something. It's a curry sourdough. It's a spicy curry sourdough, and it's crusted with black sesame seeds. Uh, honestly, it tastes like just a great bowl of soup without all the heat since it's summertime. So I don't want to eat soup right now in the summertime, but I will gladly eat this curry sourdough. So yeah, it's cool. It's a cool thing that happens in our business, and we we sort of hope that we hope to be able to continue along this, this way of doing things where people who become a part of our community sort of on the outside uh, at markets sort of work their way in when the time's right. And uh, we end up building this really great relationship with them because there's already trust established before they ever come into the bakery, uh, which for us is super important. After all, the bakery is at our house. So being able to see how somebody handles our brand at the market level before they ever kind of come into our personal space is, is a nice luxury. Well, so we're very much a market bakery and you can see that everything that I'm doing right now, it's, it's, it's really optimized for markets. We didn't start this way. So if you're, and I, I hope by now you've heard that story enough to, to believe me because seeing me unload a uh, market on this lift gate right now, it, it's luxurious and it's consistent and I have plenty of time on my hands. There's plenty of time to do this work. I have a nice buffer. So the way that we currently operate, everything is on the truck typically by midnight and we typically leave by four in the morning. So uh, yes, that means that the product lost four hours there, but that's because, quite frankly, for me to be a sustainable market baker, I need to be able to set my life up in such a way where if something goes wrong, I have time to recover. And things go wrong all the time. So I now have four hours built in where if something goes wrong, we can keep baking, we can keep getting things ready, we can keep packaging, and we can get out the door. Uh, in the beginning when we didn't have this, it was, it was rough. It was really, really, really rough because sometimes we were, yeah, maybe it was necessary, frankly. Uh, so we were baking and packaging and then l running late, running perpetually late. Uh, which is not good for your relationship with the market. It's actually the, the worst thing you can do to, to a market is to show up late. So typically they want you there 
over an hour early. Uh, and we were kind of getting, getting there in the last 30 minutes. And I was fortunately like, if you, if you have issues and you work, work on them transparently with people, people treat you better. Uh, so, you know, I was honest with the market saying, look, I, I mean, I, I come up with this trailer and I have other markets to deliver. And you know, what do you want me to do? Like I, I can't get this stuff out of the oven any faster. And the truth is without the tools that we needed, without temperature control, without all these things that sort of needed to happen first, all of that was true. Um, we only could bake eight loaves of sourdough an hour in our, in our old oven. And so as this is a great segue to talk about ovens just briefly on this whole topic of equipment. It's really, why are we doing a video of loading markets? It's, it's a great view of sort of progression and a great view of what can happen with your life as a baker where you can actually start having a sustainable situation that makes sense, that, that, that still offers a rewarding lifestyle. All this stuff is super fresh. I mean, the oven literally turned off between 11 p.m. and midnight last night, but there's plenty of time. I didn't close last night, so, you know, uh, now that we've gotten to the point that we have, we have crew, some of the crew members closed, and so I, I typically work early in the mornings. Uh, and so I got sleep. The truck was ready for me in the morning. I don't have to lift a ridiculous amount of items on my way to market, which look, I don't mind the lifting. I never minded that aspect of it. In fact, at the time it was, it was a good workout cause baking so much and standing around that market Saturday and all this like moving around was great, but it really limits the, the people you can have working this part, the delivery part. If you ever want to job this out to somebody, the more complicated it is, the harder it is to do that. Uh, so if part of the job description is lifting objects that are, that are huge like this, uh, that weigh 70, 80 pounds, you know, and, and sort of harming yourself along the way, I never felt comfortable hiring for that. Uh, whereas now, uh, like I said, a crew member is doing all the pickups later on. So again, Saturday becomes a realistic work day because, you know, I start really early. I get up at three in the morning on Saturday, but by the end of market, which ends at noon, uh, I get to basically drive straight home and another crew member, uh, is going to do all the pickups. Uh, the the real awesome thing is also I'm coming home to a, a sparkling clean bakery that's perfectly reset for the next week. And so life has sort of, and, and there's no work to do for tomorrow uh, because we take one day off a week. It just so happens it's Sunday. For us, it's not, not a religious reason or anything. It's just, we, we feel like everybody around needs one day off a week around our crew we feel a whole lot better when something's not going on. It's the only time that we really feel like we can truly rest when, and it's still, we're still babysitting product because uh, there's some production going on today, Saturday, and that product gets baked off on Monday. Uh, so our fridges still have to be functioning. So I really still can have an emergency uh, that, that caused me to work on the weekends, but we've tried to seek balance because I want to do this for a long term. That the whole idea of, of running the way that we used to, I mean, I think you can do that for some period of time until the adrenaline is no longer there because I really do think that it was no different than, than getting an, getting like an EpiPen injection every single Saturday morning. Just the, just the, the rushing, the, the fact that you could barely get the product out of the oven on time. Uh, certainly there's no time left over whatsoever for packaging. Um, so you're just trying to throw things together as best you can. 
Uh, the unreliable transportation, always worried whether something's gonna break along the way. The fact that you're running late everywhere and the stress related to that, getting everywhere on time. And then all the regular coordination. We're already still doing so much coordination on Saturday mornings. There, there's multiple crew members at every single market. We have to make sure they're there. We have to make sure the markets are staffed. We have plenty of backup people on reserve in case somebody doesn't, can't make it on a day because that's just something that happens. Um, the amount of coordination that it takes to pull off five simultaneous events, which we typically do, is insane. But that's why we've sort of invested slowly in tools uh, that, that have really made all the difference. And so when you have the right equipment and you have the right schedule, and you've sort of thought your whole business model through, things start to get better. But we really are a market bakery. Everything about who we are and how we do business is optimized for market. So going into March, it was crazy because 95% of what we did and all these risks that we took, the trucks that we bought, the equipment that we bought, everything we did was sort of dependent on live sales at the market. Uh, so anytime that we see a risk to live sales at the market, it, it was existential crisis. Uh, even rain on a Saturday morning uh, can mean existential crisis uh, before March. Uh, so, but we were lucky once again. I, this is just pure luck that things happened the way they did in the, in the year that they did because two years ago, we didn't have the resources or the tools to pivot the way we did this year. Uh, but I'd like to think that we invested so heavily in the business the last three years and took enough personal sacrifices that we put ourselves in a good position uh, to weather this sort of difficult time. Uh, so this is all the stuff that came off this market and we'll take a walk and see where, where it's being set up in the grass this market is an indoor market actually in the summertime in the winter it's got this huge parking lot and we're typically actually at the very edge over there uh, but in the summer months this market is um, it, it moves inside and this year we sort of had an option to be inside or outside and just because of the the less certain situation being indoors we elected to be outside, which in any other year, everybody is racing indoors. Uh, and, and we're fortunate that, uh, you know, typically we get a pretty decent spot here inside, but <laughs> this, this year we're subjecting ourselves to the 120 degree elements because it's just still more comfortable for us and our customers that way. Uh, so this particular market, we set up two tents. Uh, and so those go up first. These bread shelves, we have them for each market. Um, they're nice because they, with a, with a truck with a lift gate, they fit just right. Um, they're very sturdy. They're made out of solid wood. Uh, and all the elements are super affordable and easy to replace. So one of the casters actually this past week was broken and it was just a matter of a five minute fix i just bought a new caster uh flipped these over uh unscrewed one caster put another one in in fact i think there's already a video uh up of me working on these things but we built them in such a way that if they break uh which keep in mind they get moved around all the time so uh we built them in such a way that if they break, they're very easy to uh, replace. So now the guys are going to get set up here and they've still got a little bit of work in front of them. They are responsible for getting all the pre-orders together. So they're going to end up having a list here. And for us, especially at this market uh, and others, this is all stuff that's already been bought. So this, this tower is labeled pre-order uh, as well as one of the pastry towers. And so all that stuff is already spoken for. It needs to, it needs to be bagged precisely. The bags need to be ready by the start of market. 
and then customers come and pick these up and just go. They've already paid for them. Uh, meanwhile, the other half of the goods get sold. As things settle down for us, and I spent more and more time just being awake in the morning hours without the time stress of rushing and being late. Realized, wow, people who live in Arizona are really missing out when they don't wake up at three or four in the morning. Because at one in the afternoon or two in the afternoon in August, really only the crazies are outside. Uh, only the people that have such a high tolerance for heat that, I don't know, like, there are people here that just don't mind the, the heat. But uh, when you're up at three or four in the morning, even in August, it's fine outside. It's, it's pleasant. Uh, so it says a nice benefit of, of being a baker and also going out to markets, which is an early endeavor. Although it's still a very big disconnect with our customers who, you know, you see them at seven or eight in the morning and they look like they just rolled out of bed. Uh, meanwhile, like we've already lived half our day. All right. I'm not going to lie that I took the morning delivery route because I prefer it in all, in all respects, including just weather. Uh, but also it's when all the car goes on board, so it feels, feels more prudent for me as the owner to take, take the responsibility of most everybody's earnings for the week uh, on, the, on the way to the market. It's, it's a lot to be responsible for, I think. Uh, you know, something goes wrong on this, uh, on this truck route, like that one morning where I was in that fender bender, had that happened before the market, everybody's work is, is compromised for the week. And we now start Saturday products as early as Tuesday. Uh, so we have some doughs like the croissant dough that we mix all the way back on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday for Saturday morning, for Friday night bake off and Saturday morning market. And to work on processes for so many days uh, only to mess up on account of some problem with delivery uh, is devastating, really. It's just absolutely devastating. Uh, especially back when really all we had was farmer's market revenue. So the way that we sort of built our bakery was continuing to add more farmer's markets. It's not really a business model that's available to everyone because in most cases, farmer's markets are a seasonal thing. Uh, in our case, we have four year-round markets that operate, whether it's really hot in the summer or um, you know during our very, very mild non-winter. Uh, but in most places around the world, markets aren't always year-round and sometimes are very, very seasonal, uh, follow sort of the growing season. So being a market bakery in those places is, is probably less rewarding and it Maybe it does make more sense to pursue a wholesale channel. Although I'd like to speak into building a bakery for your actual customers. Uh, somebody the other day was asking me, well, who's my main distribution? And, and sort of asking this as though this was a very common question that, that like anyone like me would have an answer to. Yes. I had no idea what he was talking about. What do you mean, my main distribution? I was like, yeah, like who buys your products? Uh, the people. The people buy my products. Uh, being a market bakery, we've we haven't had that in between layer, the restaurant or the grocery store or the the in between middleman that that buys and really takes your margin away. So. Most bakers really always function at that wholesale rate. And I have to tell you that you can do the numbers. I one day, about nine or 10 months in, sat down and started writing down the amount of time that it took to do every process from shopping for ingredients to going out for ingredients to, um, to hand mixing to the time that I was in the bakery 
sort of monitoring to folding to shaping to all that and if you are a smaller cottage bakery sort of scaling up which a lot of a lot of you have aspirations to do or um, might might want to be doing or if you're still baking in your home kitchen I don't care how you do the numbers if you value yourself at just minimum wage you'll very quickly come to find that you cannot sell a loaf of whole grain sourdough for three dollars and make a profit you cannot do it you cannot do it um, not in the US uh, at least it, the, the flour itself uh, will, will cost you too much. Uh, if, if we put somewhere in the 400 gram range of, of flour, which is just shy of a pound of flour in each loaf of bread, and whole grain flour for us still is costing well over a dollar a pound, um, and we're a bakery buying by the pallet, to the to the end consumer you know uh, whole grain flour sometimes costing five six dollars a pound something like that uh, which at that point the flour itself is costing you more than I was having to sell bread for to restaurants uh, and when you're mixing by hand when you don't own delivery trucks, when you don't have dividers, when you don't have temperature control, you cannot work efficiently enough to make bread at a profit at $3. In fact, I would argue that you can't work efficiently enough to sell bread at $3. That's quality, even when you have all the tools that we've sort of acquired over the last three years. So being a market bakery makes a lot of sense when you can then sell bread at what I still think is a very reasonable cost. You know, we sell our $7 for our whole grain sourdough as of, as of 2020 uh, in, in August. And at some point those prices might change and have to go up as, as inflation happens. But we've always tried to find a price point that still is justifiable. A, a lot of our friends that are smaller time bakers, uh, they sell their bread for over 10 and frankly, they have to. If you do the math, that that's just how much it costs to to make bread in a Rofco oven uh, in in your kitchen. Uh, so, speaking of equipment, a lot of you working in kitchens are going to come across that that brand Rofco as a great brand uh, for for baking artisan bread in a kitchen. And the Rofco ovens allow you to get up to like nine loaves at a time which which is a big improvement from perhaps the two loaves that you can fit into your home oven they still cost a fair amount I, I think there's still a few thousand dollars at the very least to get one in and probably just to buy one and then you have to pay to get it installed you might have to modify some of your power sources and whatnot it's still it's still a big appliance for your home kitchen and I would argue that it's one that you will certainly grow out of it, no matter what your scale, because baking nine loaves at a time, if you're trying to make a living on bread, if you're trying to make a living on bread, um, if I can bake nine loaves and turn around nine loaves an hour, or every 40 minutes, so maybe I get a little bit of efficiency out of it, maybe. Uh, and nine times seven, my gross revenue is $63 for an hour of time, and that doesn't account for all the time that already has been spent making the product up until the time that it hits the oven. So the, the gross output of my bakery, $63 an hour, uh, if the oven is running 24 hours a day, which it won't be um, in your home kitchen with just you. Uh, I don't. I don't know that that's enough, considering that's not profit. That's not. That's not what you're taking home. You're taking home a fraction of that. I just can't see how that number works out to anything other than a hobby. Uh, and if hobby is what you're after, then that's great. I'm not trying to say that a Rothko oven doesn't bake good bread. It really does. 
I'm not trying to say it won't allow you to share more bread with your friends and family. It absolutely will. Um, I guess I'm just saying that your path forward will be certain replacement at some point. Certain replacement at some point if, you're, if your aim is to become a bakery. Uh, and, and the oven itself still is a little bit more futzy. Um, it doesn't come with steam injection. So I would, I would hold out until you can afford to spend about twice what you'll spend on a Rothko and, and get a steam injection uh, two-deck oven. I would, I would start, start there uh, at a smaller scale just because you want something that you can grow into, something that potentially you can add to. Uh, the deck ovens um, typically stack, and so depending on the manufacturer, you might be able to keep your original investment as you as you grow. Which, like, going backwards to that time where we we're buying used trucks on auction, spending two thousand here and sixteen hundred there, you think, oh well, I save money because I bought I bought this cheap thing, but then I had to replace that cheap thing very quickly. Uh, and so, did I really save any money? No. Uh, I think that ultimately I spent more money in the end keeping those really crappy pieces of equipment around uh, and then trying to service them all the time. It costs so much more stress too. This truck, even though I make monthly payments, it has three years of warranty. So when something goes wrong, I have most of the week to take care of it because really we are using it for Saturdays for delivery. Uh, to the markets during the week we do residential deliveries so people come with their vehicles and they pick up boxes from the bakery and then distribute those boxes around town so the truck gets to get a bath and get looked at and get really babied it really is babied um, but if something were to go wrong which it's a truck and i've learned that trucks have generally more problems than cars do we take it to the shop, they look at it, and it's covered under warranty for three years. So I haven't paid a single dollar in, in maintenance since we've owned this truck. And that in and of itself has been a savings considering that the year before, I spent more money on maintenance than all of my truck payments put together for the year. Uh, so I don't, I don't have exploding coolant tanks while I'm driving either. Uh, for the most part, you know, the, the truck does exactly what it is supposed to do as a, as a newer car. Uh, so we're, we're getting really close to this uh, last stop. We're in the heart of downtown Phoenix, which uh, is, is an up and coming area. If you drove through the heart of our downtown district a few years ago, you'd see absolutely nothing. Now you see a lot of construction happening, a lot of new buildings. Uh, a lot of new districts forming uh, and you know before we entered into 2020 and the, all the stuff that this year has brought downtown was just just up and coming and and flourishing in many ways uh, lots of cool new restaurants and uh, just generally the food scene in Phoenix has been one that has been evolving and growing and in large part thanks to this farmer's market which has been here for over a decade now and has really brought a ton of life to the city it was originally started and conceptualized by uh, a whole group of people which uh, involved people that were really interested in farmers markets and bringing markets to town but also involved uh, the chef and owner of the restaurant that's right next door to it phoenix public market cafe uh, he had a vision for uh, more farmers markets in the city and more local food uh, more local locally grown produce and restaurants uh, and so this market has been running ever since uh, it's it's a really nice nice one I, I like it a lot I think it captures the spirit of what a farmers market is supposed to be so uh, we're meeting Amanda here who drove our car and that's gonna be my ticket home later on She's gonna head out of market a little early so that Dylan can get the truck and, and do the pickup route. Typically, uh, this isn't the way we run it, but we are doing it a little differently today. Um, and I'm gonna get to drive home with the car. So I gotta grab all of my personal belongings. This would be my uh, last time in the car. 
in the truck, I should say. And let's get to market. We got a lot of work ahead of us.